Sorry, I just want to make sure I stop the transcription because my accent and the AI don't play well with the transcription. So <laughs> just <to> avoid <laughs> um, odd words being transcribed unnecessarily. All right. So hello, everyone. I'm Thanos Bostanis. I'm a lecturer here at the Tizar Center at the University of Kent, where we have our two ABAI verified master courses in applied behavior analysis and positive behavior support. Now, this is our monthly journal club that we organize so we can disseminate good practice in behavior analysis and all its related subfields. If you don't know the Tizard Center, it specializes in supporting people with intellectual and other developmental disabilities. It has courses, as I said, in ABA and PBS, but also in autism and analysis and intervention in intellectual and developmental disabilities. We also have a peer reviewed journal called the Tizard Learning Disability Review, which aims to promote really good practice in uh, services, and we would be very keen to welcome any uh, submissions uh, on your end. As long as you work in the field of disabilities, you don't necessarily need to do ADA, you're more than welcome to submit to TLDR. I'm going to pop uh, the website and some additional information in the chat as we go along. Uh, today, we are offering a free CU as always. Now, the way we're going to do it is throughout the presentation. I'm going to give you three keywords and you will need to email those to me at the end of the talk, along with your full name as you want it on the certificate and your BCBA certification number, not your BACB account number, okay? Your certification one. That's what we need. We will not be issuing CEUs for uh, keywords sent to me uh, after today because we want to make sure that we've uh, tightened up the process. Apparently, there have been some CEU forgeries, the BACB has said. So <laughs> don't get me started on that, but um, we want to make sure that we are, you know, very, very uh, professional and up to standards with the BACB. And that's why we're slightly strict with our expectations. I have the email, you should have that from the original um, uh, website where you signed up for the talk, but I will also pop it in the chat for your convenience. So let me welcome two of uh, our colleagues who are going to be talking today, Cassie Bro and Christine Smith, who are really, really knowledgeable behavior analysts and instructional designers. Um, I am a huge fan of them. Uh, I was just telling them uh, before the talk. I think that their work is inspiring. Uh, there's always things to learn. Uh, and, you know, when they talk, I shut up and I make notes because it's 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 such a, a beneficial and reinforcing experience. So today they're going to be discussing how we can focus a bit more on assent when we're designing our behavior analytic interventions. Uh, we have um, a technical glitch with teams, so I'm going to be the one managing their slides. So apologies if uh, there is uh, sometimes a slight delay in changing the slides and so on. I'm going to do my best to keep uh, on top of everything so to give you a very smooth experience. So without further ado, thank you very much, Cassie and Kristen, for uh, joining us today. I will let you guys do your thing and I will be here um, on the background checking the chat and changing the slides. Thank you. Oh, I can't hear you, Cassie. Oh, <laughs> that was such a lovely oh, introduction. Let me yeah, that. I was just saying that that was such a lovely introduction. Um, yeah, I feel like I should open by saying if it was uh, any other co-presenter besides Kristen, I probably would have had to bow out today because I have a terrible sinus infection. Um, but I have such faith uh, in her abilities and such respect um, for what she can do that it was like, if something happens and I fall out in the middle of the presentation, I know Kristen will do exactly as I would have done. Uh, so I think that it's uh, a testament to uh, how well we work together and also how awesome she is. Oh, well, thank you. Well, I was going to say, you know, I think in our lovely introduction, um, one of the things that one of the reasons I love presenting with you, Cassie, is um, I think in behavior analysis, and in globally in life, right? Like our goal is to evolve our practice and continue to learn and do better. So like the clinician I am today is not the clinician I was yesterday or a year before or 10 years ago. Um, and I've learned so much from you as we've like worked in Ascent and given presentations together. So I feel like every presentation we give is more nuanced and has 
more tips and details. So I'm excited to move through this stuff today with you. Yeah, me too. And hopefully my voice holds out. I've been resting it for three days, almost no speaking, which is hard to do with toddlers. So yeah, well, I was going to do an about us. Um, <laughs> I thought we could, you know, I, I think that um, at, whenever we present on Ascent, I feel like it's important to tell people kind of like where we started on our journey with Ascent, because um, I think that gives that kind of frames like where we're coming from when we're presenting. Um, so I'll go first since you just spoke, you can rest your voice. Um, so I'm Kristen and, um, I have been in the field of behavior analysis for 20 years now. And I was actually very privileged to start off my clinical practice with a very small boutique organization that really focused on Ascent. Ascent was a part of everything we did. And so I've never known behavior analysis without Ascent. Um, and like I said, I've refined it and nuanced my practice over time. Um, but I feel like that's a very unique position that I, and very privileged position that I was able to come from that I stepped into the field and sat down at the table for the first time with that being at the forefront of how I delivered intervention. Um, so yeah, I've been in the field for 20 years. I work right now, I'm an instructional designer at Central Reach, which I love. It lets me incorporate all the things that make me gloriously nerdy into my daily life and routine at work. So that's me. Awesome. I love that introduction. Uh, so I, I was just thinking as you were saying, I was like, yeah, that is a privilege. I feel like almost none of us can say that. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm Cassie Bro. Uh, I've been in the field about 18 years and did not start out um, in any place that was focusing on Ascent. I started out in public schools in New York. Um, and yeah, there were lots of times that I felt sort of uncomfortable was what was happening, but didn't really know how to verbalize, like why it made me or un uncomfortable or like in any way sort of refute what was happening. I just knew that I didn't like it and that it didn't feel good. Um, yeah, and I uh, then met a brilliant um, human who I, I worked with for a lot of years, uh, starting when he was four. Um, and when he was around 11, he explained, um, a behavioral phenomenon that had happened when he was four. Uh, and when he did, it was a, a shocking revelation for me in a scent. Um, and he actually suggested that I Google disability advocacy. Um, and that brilliant 11 year old um, who's now probably 20 and change um, is, yeah, he really changed my life because it allowed me um, to sort of find my people and find the people who are doing Ascent um, and then spend a lot of time making things for other people to also join that, essentially throwing out ropes for other people who d also did not have the privilege of starting out in a place um, that was so focused on that. Yeah, I love that story every time you tell it. Um, when I think today I'm hoping to walk away, you guys will see Cassie and I very much, uh, we have a lot to say about Ascent. So we hopefully we'll stick to these slides, but if not, you can always get them later and they have a lot of content in them because um, I think, you know, we want to define con Ascent versus consent, talk about it. But then I also wanted to give you guys a roadmap of like, here's ways you can incorporate it today. Like when you leave today, here are steps you can take to change your practice um, in a way that's beneficial to your clients. So uh, I'm hoping that that's what we get to by the end. But Cassie, do you want to take the lead with defining Ascent? I feel like you always so eloquently define it. Sure. Yeah, I feel like, so the thing about Ascent is when we're talking about people that we're working with, we're almost always getting, I should be always, getting consent, right? So we are getting legal permission to be doing what we're doing. Um, when you work in any type of um, field where you're working with people with diagnoses that may or may not make them legally able to consent, even if they're over 18, um, there is a consideration that needs to be taken, right? Like if I um, consent for a medical study, there is no one who needs to consent but me. Um, I'm an adult person. I'm over 18. I'm presumed to be, and I put giant quotes around this competent because I think that's where we'll get into some of the ableist um, language later. And so no one questions that. Uh, so for me, assent and consent go together. Um, for people who are under 18, for people who otherwise cannot legally consent um, based on their legal status um, uh, or their framework as having a guardianship, 
assent is their agreement to participate. Uh, and unlike consent, where um, removing consent can sometimes be very formal, right? Like if I was in a medical trial, I might have to sign something that says, I no longer consent to this medical trial, or I may just actually leave the space, right? With assent, it's much more fluid, which means I might assent to one activity and then two minutes later, not assent to a different activity. Um, I might assent to an activity and then 30 seconds later, change my mind and no longer assent to it. And you might be wondering, well, if it's, you know, if consent is so formal, what does assent look like? And assent really looks like talking with my behavior, talking with my words, whatever form that looks like. Um, and also um, a lot of times talking with my body language, which means for some uh, of the people that we work with, it may be slightly recoiling their body. It may be refusing to do the activity um, that we are doing. It might just be sitting and staring, especially, we'll talk about this, I, I expect, as we go on, um, but especially when we talk about um, individuals that have had a lot of compliance training, uh, a lot of times you'll see that they won't actually do behaviors um, that strongly suggest that they remove their assent, but they might just sit very still um, and and not be actively participating. Uh, and as heartbreaking as that is, it's usually a product of um, of having been, um, yeah, having been uh, compliance trained in a way where they feel like they can't do those behaviors um, without an unpleasant consequence, which is unfortunate. So assent is really just the non-legal agreement to participate, um, but it can look really different depending on who's giving it, which is why we need to take data on assent um, withdrawal behaviors and assent behaviors for all the people that we work with. Yeah, and I think, you know, thinking about it in, as like a fluid thing also lets us kind of define assent-based intervention, right? Because that's intervention where a learner's assent is at the core of everything we do. So we're constantly checking in to make sure they are assenting to participate. They're assenting to be close to us. And I'm not talking about just work, like they're assenting to have you come play with them or um, be speaking to them while they're playing, you know, um, and really taking that to the core and evaluating it, but then also just constantly checking it in and really making it a part of the entire practice. So like not one work demand is placed until we know that we have a scent. Um, and then on the flip side, that's also looking at our intervention as really the independent variable to that ascent. So if the learner is not giving us assent, what can we change about what we're doing, the way we're doing it um, to then gain assent from the learner to continue or not? And then go into bigger problem solving steps. Um, and I think, you know, Cassie, you've done so much work in this, but like thinking about um, how assent ties into like these bigger areas of like self-determination and choice making that are on our ethical compliance code, but also just core features of, or pillars of the practice of behavior analysis, I think is really important. Like those are things we want for all of our clients because gaining assent from a four-year-old teaches them when they're five, six, seven, and then 20, 30, 40, that people need to have their permission to do things. And I think that's a really important thing. And we try to teach our neurotypical children to do that. So why are we not doing that with the clients in our ABA programs, right? Or not doing it to the extent where it's like the focus of everything. Absolutely. Yeah. So Great. yeah, I was going to say you put the, the threats to a sense so beautifully here, which is uh, I think we've already mentioned this, but ableism is a, I think, the largest threat to assent, um, which is if we're not, um, if we're not taking information, taking data on someone's assent behaviors and their assent withdrawal behaviors, we're not going to know whether they're giving it to us or not. Um, and apart from those um, privileged, I would say few, but maybe it's changing now over time, um, from those privileged folks who um, start out in a place that uh, really focuses on ascent from, from the beginning of their career. Um, ableism is so pervasive that we really have to actively fight it, like all the other isms. If we are not actively fighting it, actively reflecting on it, we are part of the problem. Uh, and we can assume that we're a substantial part of the problem. And with a sense, it is no different. So ableism is just what it sounds like. Um, it is uh, discrimination in favor of, originally the term was used for able-bodied people, and I put giant quotes around that, 
Um, but it was the idea that um, in the time during the 50s through 70s where um, people with physical disabilities were trying to get just basic accommodations, um, people used this term for the first time in talking about the discrimination uh, that they faced in favor of able-bodied people. Again, big quotes around this. And now it has been used um, by autistic advocates, and you'll hear both Kristen and I use the word autistic, um, which is identity first language, which is what the autistic community has asked us to use. So it is what we use um, in favor of neurotypical people. Um, and this will be discrimination of autistic people or neurodiverse people in favor of neurotypical people. And so some of the, um, the ways that we see that, which we'll sort of unpack as we go, is really that um, any time that we're assuming that we are right, that we know better, or um, that we are more competent than someone because they have um, a, a diagnosis, whether that be of developmental disabilities, autism, or otherwise, we can safely know that we are engaging in some form of ableism. So it really becomes an active practice of checking in of like, what have I learned in my life that lets me think that this is an okay thing to do, right? So it's like when I make a goal um, that I want someone to use um, verbal vocal language um, instead of using uh, a device that may be more comfortable for them. Like, why am I making that choice? Am I making that choice because it's the best choice for the person? Or am I making that choice because I think it'll be easier for them to be out in the world instead of saying the world should make it okay for them to be out in the world regardless of the way that they communicate? Sort of it reflections in that way. And then um, I think the learner's current and historical contingencies are is brilliantly put. Um, but it is essentially that so often um, by the time that people get to us, by the time that a, a, assuming a, a child, maybe not even a young child, gets to us, um, they have had perhaps ABA that has not been based in assent. And they have learned that if they don't act uh, in certain ways, um, that they will meet contingencies that are unpleasant. So often uh, they don't even know that that's something that they can do, which is really um, unfortunate and heartbreaking uh, and really speaks to the change that we need to make. Uh, yeah, and then Kristen, I'll throw it to you just to rest this voice and because you're brilliant. Yeah, well, and I, I kind of, as you were talking, I feel like this is a great point to like bring in the article that we had sent out as a suggested reading because I want to preface with I think it is phenomenal that this was published like I remember when I heard it came out and I like messaged you right away and was like yes there's here's something it has a scent in the title you know it's and I think you know as a science we're basing our applied practice on research and experimental practice so the fact that like this is being talked about in a research context I think is really important so that being said um there were some parts in even this publication where uh they were talking about Ascent and obtaining it. And they even said, I'm going to, they said, the individuals with ASD and DD are primarily re related to behavior or barriers to their ability to provide assent. So, like, even in this article, they're saying, you know, sometimes autistic people can't always provide assent, they've got barriers. And they talked a lot about how um, many of the, the published literature that's out there, they're obtaining assent through writing or through like complex spoken relations, which in that is ableist, right? Like many of 40% of our learners aren't gonna be able to give assent that way. And so when we're talking about it, especially in our research, we need to be looking at how can we broaden that? Um, and what does assent really look like? And not what does it look like for me or my children? What does it look like for this individual learner, right? Um, and so I think with the, you know, with resilience and changing contingencies, one thing we also really need to be looking at for our learners is, I can have a session that is beautiful where my learner is, you know, giving me a scent every time I'm asking for it and making sure it's happening. And then they go out of their session to school and that doesn't happen. So what does that look like for that learner, right? Where their no isn't honored anymore or their ascent isn't something that's at the forefront. So not only do we need to be training across context, like going to school and training the school team, but we also need to train our learners to be resilient and be advocating for themselves um, because those ultimately are the skills that are going to allow them to make sure that other people get their assent and that it's super clear, right? Yeah. Okay. Can I just I feel like, to yeah. say that our first keyword is 
resilience. Our first keyword is resilience. Thank you. Yeah, <clears throat> and I'll just throw this caveat in there, and thanks for going to the next slide because I would get stuck on this forever, <laughs> is that I think it's really important for us to be doing that work, but at the same time as practitioners, like building a world where someone doesn't have to be resilient to get their no accepted. Because like it still is this idea, I feel like it's the same thing uh, it reminds me a little bit when we talk about sort of the Me Too movement, where it's like we spend a lot of time teaching, I'd, I and I put giant quotes around this because gender is a construct, but we spend a lot of time teaching girls to be how to keep themselves safe instead of teaching the rest of the world how to act appropriately. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel like this is that. It's like the 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 flip of that model, right? Which is, yep. yes, I, I want to teach someone to be resilient because right now, the world is not a great place and isn't doing this. But at the same time, I want to do the active change that we need to do as a field and larger, more broadly, the field of education, the field of psychology in the way that no matter where they go, their ascent is going to be accepted, respected. Um, yeah, and really let there be sort of a hard stop on the fact that we put it to them. But for now, unfortunately, this is the place where we have to put it while we do that work. But just as much as this work is important, the work of doing that other work, making those places more acceptable um, is important to do. Yeah, and I think thinking about it, and we'll get into this in later slides, but as ascent and then repertoires related to ascent. So it's the, only, the thing we're teaching is not just like, yes, I'll work with you. It's teaching the learner to also advocate for themselves to explain why they need something, to persist if someone doesn't hear them or if they do it incorrectly, um, to tolerate delays to that. Because there might be times when like, you know, there has to be a slight delay. Like if it's too loud, you're gonna have to walk out of the gymnasium or the auditorium to where a quieter place is. Um, so really looking at for each learner, like what is a scent for that learner? And then what are the repertoires around that that we need to be building upon for that learner? Absolutely. And I had, I mean, I just had to put this in because I feel like um, anytime we talk to people, or I'm speaking for you, anytime I talk to people about ascent, um, these are the questions I always get. You know, the isn't the, aren't they just trying to escape work? Like, aren't we just reinforcing them escaping work? Which I always say, yes, you are. We are. We're reinforcing them saying they need to be done with work. Um, but I think, you know, these are the questions we get. So oftentimes there's a lot of pushback around um, letting our clients have a voice and um, say no in the context of intervention. And then um, how that's tied to funding, I think, too, is is difficult for clinicians to wrap their heads around, right? Um, if you have a learner, and I've had many learners who have engaged in pretty significant assent withdrawal behavior where they don't want to participate in the session at all, so we have to go back you know, completely revamp the session, change the way the programs are run and distributed. And then now you have to explain that to a funding source, why that program looks different, why the rate of progress is different. Um, but again, I think that's kind of what you just said, Cassie, of really looking at like making systemic change. So explaining the value of that to an insurance company, you know, it makes this individual less likely to be sexually abused in the future because they don't think they always just have to say yes and let other people touch and move their body. Um, or, you know, it makes them, you know, we're teaching this in the form of self-advocacy. So it's really important that they can advocate for themselves. And that's a critical repertoire for all human beings, right? Um, so if you've thought any of these things, any of you, that's fine. We have answers for you in the subsequent slides. But I want to acknowledge that that's, you know, usually people's first response. I'll just dive right into this if you're okay with that, Cassie. Okay. Totally. Because <laughs> as you guys will find out, I'm extremely nerdy and detail oriented when it comes to instructional design and measurement, um, which this is why behavior analysis is the perfect field for me. Um, so when you're looking at incorporating ascent, you know, I always think there's two different ways you can do this. You're either starting your journey on ascent where you see this presentation and you're like, yes, I want my clients to have a voice. I want them to be able to say no, and I'm going to do the work to get us to the place where they'll say yes. Then there's also people who come who have been incorporating ascent into their practice and they're looking for additional tips and tricks to really like make it more robust, make it more ascent focused. And so I see that these are the four areas that anybody, whether you're on this end of the spectrum or this end, this is where you can come in and say, hey, these are the four pieces I need to be looking at. So first is, you know, really making instruction um, on ascent 
and through those related repertoires I just spoke about, really looking at that and designing instruction for it. So what we don't want to do is just say, we're going to measure a scent. You know, we're going to measure it and make sure it's happening. Sometimes it's not, but we're collecting data points. And then that's where you leave it. Really, really consider that as your dependent variable, like I said earlier. So you want to be measuring it and evaluating it throughout and then responding to it in an analytical and data-based way. So that leads us to number two, which is measurement. So again, we want to be looking at ascent as that dependent variable and repertoires related to that. And I'll dive in a little bit deeper around how you can do that. And then staff training. So Cassie, I feel like this is one area I have really learned from you in is like you have the most brilliant mind when it comes to <laughs> incorporating ascent into getting staff going and getting staff who work in clinics, like getting their buy-in and like just orchestrating different organizational systems that really puts ascent in the forefront of the organization, not just individual clinicians. Um, and then training staff to implement ascent-based procedures and respond appropriately. And then the last thing, which I think is really important, and I, for some reason we always forget to do this, but really looking at incorporating ascent and client voice into the assessment process, because this is kind of like the seed that, you know, leads us to intervention. And so if we're only asking information of people all around and then taking our own observations of the client without actually soliciting feedback from them, then what are we doing, right? Like we've started off on the foot where we're not incorporating a client assent and values into our treatment. Um, so one tip that one of the organizations I used to work at always had us do, which I absolutely loved, was as part of our treatment plan, we had to have a quote from our client or have like a paragraph that detailed the way in which the client was like contributing to intervention. So programs they liked, programs they didn't like, um, you know, soliciting an actual quote from them about how they feel about the program and their progress, um, but making that actually a, a part of the treatment plan, which you can get from assessment, is I think a really great idea. Well, I probably should take this one too. <laughs> this is my nerd. Um, so I just wanted to give some content around, um, you know, just more specifics of each of those four areas. And so when we're looking at instruction on Ascent and those other repertoires, I kind of just broke out some ideas here um, for ways that you can begin providing instruction. And um, when we think about Ascent, you know, we want to operationally define it for the learner. And I think we do that both by doing it topographically. So here's the way it looks for this learner. Let's make a list as a team and we agree on it. But then let's also functionally define it for the learner, right? So the form of the behavior may change, but the function stays the same, right? So people in the moment can be able to identify new forms of ascent or the withdrawal of ascent. Um, and then really thinking about ways we can teach uh, our clients to give ascent or draw ascent that are more obvious, right? So if like Cassie described earlier, you have a learner who is just kind of shutting down and that's their way of withdrawing their ascent to participate, then teaching them to say all done or touch a picture of all done or say stop, you know, like really giving them um, more power in different forms of behavior to be demonstrating that. Um, and then looking at self advocacy. So like we were talking about earlier, really having um, clients be able to advocate for themselves. So once, you know, they've they are demonstrating that initial no behavior, they can add a no because or no, this is what I need instead, or just straight up no, get away from me, <laughs> you know, um, whatever that learner needs. And really building these repertoires. So obviously these aren't things you could necessarily teach at the same time for all learners, but looking at how do you systematically design instruction across these types of content areas to build up this repertoire for your learner. Do you have any thoughts on that, Cassie? I was just, <laughs> I was thinking actually how, how we do this for neurotypical kids so easily and so it's like sort of built-in gentle parenting right mm -hmm. um I remember with my kids I taught my daughter to say she would like scream if I said no to something and I think what she was actually even at a very young age and I think what she was actually trying to say is like I care about this like this isn't me just asking you this because I feel like it I'm really like, this is, this is what I need right now. So one of the ways that I taught her to do that, as I would say, what if you just said, I'm really passionate about this. And that would let me know that this meant a lot to you. And so if I was just saying, no, 
I don't know, because parenting rules say that I should say no, um, but you're really passionate about it. That lets me sort of renegotiate my answer if I if I care enough about this to override your passion. Right. Um, yeah. And I feel like for for her and I, it was an easy way for me to make out the difference. Like if she's like, I want cake for breakfast. And I'm like, you know, we don't do cake for breakfast because that's not. I don't know, healthy, even though it's probably no different than cereal, honestly, especially yeah. here in the U.S. But and then if she said, I'm really passionate about this, then it would allow me to ask the follow up questions like, is it this specifically that you want? Is there another way that we can do this? So it allowed me to know when I needed to make a difference. So it, I feel like it this is such a gift to give to every human at all stage uh, stages to essentially say, um, and yeah, Grace, you're absolutely right that it is not it is not hard and fast in all neurotypical situations too. I feel like um, there once was somebody asked me in a training uh, once they were like, "What if your like 18 month old doesn't want to wear a diaper and they like keep taking their diaper off?" Um, and I was kind of like, "Well, I probably let them be without their diaper inside my house while I like figured out what was going on. Cause there's usually like, maybe the skin just feels nice to be free or like, maybe there's like diaper rash going on. Like, are we asking? So it is interesting that we have this. Um, a lot of times I give a general rule of like, if you wouldn't do that with a same age neurotypical peer, don't do that with anyone. And then sort of as a follow-up caveat of being like, but like, do you really have to do that with a t same age neurotypical peer as like icing on the cake, right? Or is it yeah. just something that like we learned that we had to do, which is why that like I'm passionate really helped. And now it's funny, my son is a year younger than her. Uh, and he says, I'm impassionated about <laughs> it. And I'm like, who could, he basically just gets whatever because I'm like, if you say impassionated, I think that's hysterical and I'm going to say yes to whatever it is. So totally. Well, and I think you bring up a really good point too, though. Um, subtly, you brought it up because if we're not teaching these things, right? So then what happens? So I'm going to use an example of my children now. So I have an 18 month old who has um, two sisters who are seven and eight who love him to death. So he's, he's a boy, he's the third kid. He's like talking, but not like he yells a lot. Every time they're like hugging onto him and he doesn't want it, he'll be like, uh, uh, and they keep going. And I keep telling them, hey, you have to listen because that's him telling you he's not giving you permission to do that. And what's going to happen if we don't reinforce it? He's going to start hitting you. He's going to run away from you and avoid you. He's going to take that mop that he's playing with and he's going to smack you over the head with it. And so when I, I think when we're talking about our artistic learners too, if we are not honoring their assent, what we're doing is creating a situation where they're, where they're having impassioned moments or they're feeling really passionate about something that they really need. And we're creating a situation where they're then gonna escalate because they're saying, I have to have this happen. I have to get away from you. I have to stop working. I have to do whatever. And I'm gonna show you by escalating to the point where it, now we've lost a teachable moment and we've put you in a position where you're in, in a high stress situation, right? So I think when we're not looking at teaching those alternative behaviors or or honoring that assent, then that's when we're also, we're creating a situation where our clients then have to escalate to communicate with us and let them know how important it is, right? Definitely. So. Measurement. I know, this is why I love having you here because I don't have to do much work when you're here. <laughs> uh, this is, as a selfish perspective makes it very easy on me. Um, yeah, Kristen can tell you we're, we're currently writing a manuscript on Ascent and I wrote like all the fun stuff, which was like, <laughs> here's where like the Ascent is in the ethical codes. Here's the definition of it here, are, like the barriers. And then I was like, Kristen, can you write like all the measurement stuff? Thanks. <laughs> um, which well, is great. Maybe that's the fun part. So I'm like, yes, I cannot wait. And this is why we're friends. But yeah, Kristen's brilliant when it comes to measurement. And this is where I learned from from Kristen and the fact that I was like, I feel like I was in the point of a, as a practitioner where I was like, I know I should be doing this, but I and I know in general what I want from clinics, what I want them to be doing. But what I'm not as good at is verbalizing exactly what that ascent is going to look like, like exactly what those measures are going to be like. I know what I want from a human perspective tell me about it in numbers. And I feel like Kristen like brought the party. 
Yeah, I see the world like the matrix with the, I'm a precision teacher. So I think it's like inherent in who I am. Um, and I just noticed like, of course, on my measurement slide, there's all number ones. Like I got the numbers wrong on it, which is ironic. Um, but so these yeah. are all important. Number one, number yeah. one, number <laughs> one, number one. <laughs> Well, so I think that, you know, we, I want to go over this pretty quickly because I, we also have some really great content in terms of staff training and culture shifts in an organization, which I feel like is less talked about. Um, but I think, you know, again, just really making sure that clinicians are measuring a sense. So I always look at it as, um, you know, having your correct and I hate to call it incorrect because it's not incorrect, right? It's all behavior. It's all communication, but collecting data on, you know, like the number of ascents where the learner was able to calmly communicate. And then the number of withdrawals of assent where the learner couldn't, they were past the point where they had to get up and run from the table or they swiped the materials or they hit someone or, you know, like they've, they've exited the, the moment, they've reached the point where they have to escalate to get away. Um, and looking to decrease those over time and then increase those appropriate withdrawals of assent. Um, and so, you know, counting those as micro level data throughout the session are great. But then I also included here, like you can count weekly measures for a more meso level or a more meta level measure. Or one thing I love to do is on each chart or graph, I'll note whenever there's an ascent withdrawal during instruction on that program. So then if you come as a clinician and you see, oh my gosh, like the past five days, the learners made progress, but they've been withdrawing ascent every day. Something needs to change, right? Like there's a bigger picture problem here. So I think, you know, looking both within skill instruction and across skill instruction is really important. Um, so let's, that's all. And Cassie and I have written a lot of blogs that you'll see in the reference and done trainings where we have more information on measurement. If you want more, um, you can go look at those. Yeah, check that out. Um, I was going to say, we both work at Central Reach, which I forgot to say at some point, but Central Reach has a really brilliant perspective and really collects smart smart people who are doing great things and one of the things that they really let us do is make things that we care about and things that matter so we have um i think it's seven hours six hours of ascent based stuff um within a learning path that you can take and it's sort of ordered to be like hey start here if you're new to this and build your way up and it includes um some of our we webinars on measurement and things like that yeah supervision yeah. Can I just jump in and give the second keyword? It's impassionated. Oh. I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. I know it's it. Mind, but I, I think, love thank it. God I had my mic muted because that cracked me up so much. It happened so much <laughs> well, on the background. Um, so the second keyword is impassionated. Um, thank you very much for that. That was brilliant. You are welcome. It was, you know, came from the the mouth of babes. If you would have seen how quickly I was like, I'm sorry, hang on, let me get my phone. You are what? I would just like to have a <laughs> recording of that forever. Um, great. And then this is a good one. I feel like for me, when we talk about staff training, we really want to we want to shift the whole culture of an organization. Like it's not a, it is lip service if we're just saying we're slapping an ascent measure at the bottom of every data sheet. Or if we say, like, it really needs to be measurement within the intervention sessions. And then also talking about onboarding, like it needs to be stated in our onboarding, both with clients and with staff. It needs to be us stating our principles and our values of assent of what we will do as far as like punishment, extinction, self-stimulatory behaviors, how we feel about whatever that is. And I hope it's punishment, rarely if ever extinction rarely if ever um self-stimulatory behavior only if it's incredibly unsafe well we like whatever it is for you that's just what it would be for me um and yes he did say impassionated uh but yeah we we really need to like bring that into all aspects of a culture mm -hmm. And I think too, incorporating it as part of employee training right so like if you've got a form you're filling out while you're doing a direct observation something on there that says how often are they obtaining assent or evaluating whether they have it are they responding when the, the learner's withdrawing assent because i think it starts there right like if we're not training the staff as part of their training procedure to be responding to that functionally then what are we doing right like they're unlikely to do it when we are not there in the session with them um Absolutely. yeah so i think there's lots of different measurements you know if if staff are having a hard time with that they can tally their own like do some self-monitoring around the number of times i obtained assent, the number of times I noticed that the learner withdrew assent, the number of times I identified a new topography of withdrawing assent. 
Like those are all different things that staff can be evaluating on their own performance during sessions. Um, and I, you know, one thing I always love to is um, at the places I've worked, we've always done like shares of data. So like have one of the ones you do be, hey, come and show us your chart or your graph on ascent withdrawal and what you've done, the interventions you've done. Um, or give us in your learner profile, talk to us about this learner and functionally and topographically how you've defined ascent or how you've modified it. So really making it a part of like how the organization like moves and interacts with each other. Perfect. Yeah, can you flip to the next slide for us? Thank you. Yeah, Kristen beautifully put these examples. It may be hard to see on here, um, but on the slides that are a handout, you can definitely zoom in um, more in that way to sort of see some of these examples. And Kristen, if you want to throw us a few. Yeah, so I think, again, thinking about assessments where there's self-report. So like we have the brief that has a self-report. Um, the the BASC includes a lot around, it has a self-report. It also includes some pieces around resilience and advocacy. Um, the SEER, so I love implementing assessments that look at relationships between clients and their families because I think, you know, we can teach our clients to talk, we can teach them to play, but like if the quality of life is not improving in, you know, in their relationships and in their happiness, then who cares if you can talk or play if you're miserable, right? Um, so like the SEERS, that's the social emotional assets and resilient scale is fantastic. And then if anybody is not using the AFOLs, the AFOLs has a whole section on self-advocacy that's great. Um, so really just, you know, I know assessments are expensive. They can be time consuming to implement, but really look at how can you adjust the assessments that you're implementing to make sure that your learners are, their voice is heard um, and that you're measuring things that are significant for the learner and their parent. Um, yeah, I think, and this is, you'll, again, you can ask for these slides, and this is also in a blog that I wrote around measurement that's in the resources that you can reference, and it talks about, oh, there it is. I just transitioned right to that slide beautifully. Um, so I purposely included a lot of citations here, um, just so that these are resources. There's two pages of them, um, because I think, you know, it, Ascent has not been in the research recently or it is more recently, but it really hasn't been. Like it's difficult to find publications that talk about Ascent. Um, and so I think, you know, any anything that we can find and share and suggest to read is really, really awesome. So you have it all now. Sweet. Yeah, so I think that, yeah, I was gonna say, I wanted to leave a little bit more room for questions if we could, so. Um, as usual, Kristen and I flow at exactly the same rate, which I love. Um, so yeah, I think we've got a little extra time. Any questions, guys? You can pop them in the chat. I'm happy to read them out for you. Or if you feel comfortable switching on your mic, mic by all means do so. As people are, you know, because I know that's usually we've got a delay because people might be thinking about the question or they might be typing. Um, thank you very, very much for this. This is really, really useful. And um, I agree that it's really important that we we incorporate ascent based interventions more. Could I could I just ask you to elaborate just a bit on the skills that you would focus on? So what would be, you know, like what would be some if I were to say to you, okay, give me like, you know, the five first skills that usually come to mind about developing that you really need to develop in terms of ascent, what would those be, for example? Oh, yeah. So as soon as we have, um, uh, from the moment that we start working with someone, we should be taking data on their ascent withdrawal behaviors. So before they even get in the door, if I'm interviewing with their parents or with other like um, stakeholders, that's going to be one of the questions that I'm asking. Like, how do you know when they don't like something? How do you know when they want something to stop? So by the time they get to me, um, I do want to observe those myself. But what I really want to do uh, is start teaching them other ways to share that with me. So like starting with a no card or a stop card is like a, a if, if I'm working with a learner who's, if that's my like lowest threshold, that's where I'm going to go. So that anytime I'm doing something that you don't like, you touch that and I stop what I'm doing. And it needs to become a really powerful tool and it needs to work every time. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you hadn't figured out, I like to talk. You want me to stop talking? 
point to that button or, you know, point to this, uh, this sign that's on your desk and I'm going to stop and I'm going to go away. Um, and it really becomes a powerful tool. And especially the more places that we can get that utilized in their environment, the better off we are. So I think for my first one, that's it. Yeah, I think then building on that. So when you are implementing that, analyze what are the contexts in which that learner is usually withdrawing assent? Is it because people are too close? Is it because the program's really hard? Is it because they're exhausted because they've been doing three hours of programming? And then from there, you start to tack on some of that self-advocacy. So I want to stop because you're too close, or I want to stop because I don't like to be touched. Um, and then you can build into you know, do it a different way, or I want it's harder, or easier. So really getting the learner to, um, whether it's vocally or through an AAC device, be able to tap what the problem is with um, what's going on or respond to questions about alternatives, right? So if they're withdrawing assent a lot during difficult work, you can ask, well, do you want me to make it easier or do you want to just stop? And then they can answer that question. Um, and either is an okay answer, right? Like Cassie said, if they say, I want to stop and you're like, okay, stop and you can still keep the contingencies in place in a non-coercive way like that's fine you know we were working for this i just want to make sure that you're cool that we're gonna we're gonna stop working toward you know getting some playtime on the trampoline you know but that's totally cool we can stop and i think it's it's very difficult to make sure to not be coercive right in that way because it can come across as very coercive um so we've got a couple of questions coming in. I don't know yeah. if you guys can see them in the this, chat or not. I do. I actually think this speaks to the second question, which is how do you distinguish the situation where the learner is not showing assent by saying I can do it and showing no willingness versus them needing encouragement to complete a task. Like you can do it. Let's give it a try. This is the tough, for me, this is the nuance that really matters. Because when we talk about like coercive behavior, this is where I can feel like I'm I'm like respecting their assent, but then also like still be working for the thing that I want and sort of overriding them, right? So it can be this idea of, for me, I wouldn't go to, you can do it, let's give it a try. But it may be asking the follow-up question of like, what about this isn't working? And whatever form that works for that learner, right? So it might be saying, like having a backup material that's slightly easier so I can see like, oh, it was just like this additional level of skill or like what prerequisite is missing for this person to be able to do that skill. Um, you're exactly right. How can I make this easier? And I find I always like if I'm going in with a material, I almost always have a backup material that's slightly easier so that I can very easily be like, hey, so this learner may not be able to answer the question for me in the way that would work for me, again, ableist, right? But like I very quickly have like an easier version, which is going to tell me if it's the ease that's the problem or if there's something else that's going on. Um, yeah. I was going to say, I think too, so thinking about learners who maybe have less um, vocal skills, um, that's where you can also say, okay, we're going to take a break. You said stop. And then bring them back with like whatever the new set of materials is or your new um, non-physical prompting strategy. And you're like, hey, do you want to try it again? And I'll like help do like a laser pointer on the card so you can touch it. And if they opt out again, then you know, okay, a bigger change needs to happen. Um, but, you know, providing or giving them a visual of what that alternative is, I think is really helpful too. Yeah, I think this um, this question that's new in the chat says, would you consider the child should have a healthy, steady man repertoire before teaching the man for refusal? Actually, no. And I will tell you why. It's because people innately are very good learners. Like we figure out quickly what works and what doesn't work for us um, as people. And I feel like um, it even if we don't have a man repertoire as defined by me with my ableist view, right? Um, you can still operate that system, especially if it's a system that's designed to work specifically for that learner. And I think if you have, if you're starting practice with a learner who doesn't have a very strong manned repertoire, or what they do, that's the first thing you teach, right? You go into play and you have all done on the back of your tablet, like a symbol on the back of your tablet or your clipboard or whatever. And if you get close and you see them doing something that is letting you know they're withdrawing assent, then you're like, oh, you're saying stop. You're saying stop, I'm going to stop. And you very clearly teach that contingency first because that's going to be the most powerful thing, right? That's going to set you in such a, a great direction for your intervention. It's also going to be so strongly reinforcing for the learner. Like that's a great man to make people go away or make a negative or an aversive contingency stop, right? Oh, yeah. I was just thinking 
like I, I sort of frame it of like, what would you want, right? Like if, if somebody was going to teach you, if you had no way to communicate, right? You're starting fresh. You're in a place where no one can understand you and you can't understand anyone. And someone's like, you know what I'm going to, like you go to a foreign country, right? And they say, okay, what's the first word that you would want to know? For me, it would be no, right? Like, yes, bathroom is probably helpful for me. But like, no is going to be it. Because if someone starts doing something that I don't want, I want to be able to be like, no, if that's the only word that I ever had, that would be the first one that I would want. And so I think that offering that to our clients is really important. Yeah. And I think we had a question more towards the beginning that I just, I didn't want to miss. Um, so it was... Uh, oh yeah. So, uh, giving, do you find that a lot of people take topographical based decisions? Like I'm going to do it like this because it'll be easier for them to remove a scent or consent, but then don't honor the removal because they changed it, they changed the way they're doing it and, and they argue that they are doing it. I'm so I, I'm going to make assumptions here. So if I get this wrong, let me know. But I do think that there is this idea of I'm going to make it easier for them to say it to other people who aren't me instead of being like, I'm going to train everybody in their immediate environment to operate on this system, um, which would probably be my my first jump uh, to do. And then I think the other thing that's really important is just realizing that I want to teach this easier method, right? This method that's going to transfer to more environments, this method that's a... Um, again, ableist view, this method that's like an easier advocacy tool. I do want to build for that, but at the same time, I'm going to respect anything that you give me. Even if we're six months into working together and you suddenly like scream and throw yourself on the floor, even if you haven't done that in months and you can readily give me a no card um, whenever you don't want something, I'm still going to honor that because the behavior is the same, which is a way of saying this isn't okay. Um, and I feel like that's another way that for me, it's really important to frame like, where are my ableist thoughts here? Which is thinking that once we reach a certain threshold, like once they've learned a certain amount of skills, they're not ever going to resort to that again because they have these new skills instead of realizing that like all humans do this. Like if you've ever seen those videos on YouTube where people just like ham out in a department store because they, you know, can't return their item. Like we all have a threshold where we lose it and become the least great versions of ourselves. And the assumptions that some people get to do that and some people don't, I think is what really comes from like an ableist perspective. Well, and I think too, um, so I have two thoughts. One also is like, everyone's allowed to have a crappy day, right? Like it's okay for the learner to have a day where they're like, I had seven hours of school, then I came home and had a snack and now here you are. And you're having me like talk about pictures and talk about problem solving and I'm just not into it. And so I think like, uh, acknowledge, it's part of acknowledging too that like you're a human being, it's okay for you to say no. It's okay for you to have a day where you need a lighter load, right? Like we all have those days. Also where we like break down in communication. Like I certainly have fought with my spouse over silly things that were my fault that I could have communicated much better. Um, and I think then the other thing I wanna say is I've actually had learners where we've seen trends in their data where they would hit, it was very predictable. Like every, you know, three and a half weeks, then we can predict like from my teenage, some of my teenage girl clients, she's going to start her period. So she's going to have a, a few days that are really challenging. She's going to withdraw scent a lot because physiologically she has so much going on. Like she just cannot be there and present and work. So then we can adjust the sessions, right? Like we can make them easier. We can make them shorter. We can cancel them um, to address some of those needs that are happening. Um, I've also had clients, a uh, client who had a, ended up having a blood disorder and it was the same thing. We saw his ascent withdrawals were really cyclical in nature to the point where we could predict when they were coming. And so I don't want to like, I think it's also to point, important to point out that aside from being a basic human right, that these data can give you information too about things that might be going on with your learner that other data you're collecting may not capture. And they can help you advocate for your learner in ways that are really important for that learner. Yeah, I think I was just thinking of like me today, right? Like I came into this being like, hey, I have a sinus infection. I'm operating on about 70% brain power uh, for what I usually am. Thank goodness I have Kristen who's operating at a higher percentage of her brain power. I, you know, I would like to set that up in advance. So you'll ask the hard questions to Kristen because she can probably take it today. Um, that's like we offer that to neurotypical adults all the time. 
Like what happened when I came on uh, and said that to Thanos? What did he say? Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. So glad that you're here. Like we make those adjustments for people. And so it's just making those adjustments for everybody, regardless of their diagnosis. Yeah. Could I, could I ask a quick question? Do you think that doing a component composite or element compound analysis, you choose which term you prefer, uh, do you find that that helps with not having uh, ascent withdrawn as much uh, because you're in a way working from those basic skills and upwards, so you're in a way you're building that competency and things are easier for people, or do you still think that uh, it, it doesn't really matter, you're still going to get a lot of ascent withdrawals for other contingencies and other reasons? I, this is probably going to be, it's funny, in my mind, I'm like, I want the ascent withdrawals because it tells me so much about what I'm doing. Like, it's the feedback that I need. But I think you're absolutely right that when the two biggest things that I see, this is non um, research based, like this is the anecdotal evidence that I have. The two biggest uh, issues that I see with Ascent is usually environmental conditions that are not conducive to learning for the learner, which is light, sound, other people, smells, whatever it could be in the environment that's not working for them, and then the lack of prerequisite skills. So almost always, those are like my two go-to, but anytime that I'm getting Ascent withdrawal data, like my reaction to your question is almost like, but I want it no matter what it is because it lets me it lets me know. Like I don't think having it needs to be a mark of not success. I actually think having it is like, oh, I like learned something new about you and about what you're comfortable with today. I'm going to readjust and show up tomorrow better. That's a really good point. Yeah, but Sorry. I think it does help. Yeah, okay. I think that was right. I think that when you use an element compound analysis, you're sequencing instruction in a way that minimizes the chance that you'll miss those prerequisites. And then if you do it in the context of those related repertoires to ascent, then you're also teaching up repertoires where their ascent or withdrawal of ascent will topographically be more socially uh, easy to respond to, right? Like, I don't want to do this because it's too hard is easier for clinicians to res to understand and respond to than like falling to the ground in the middle of the session, right? So it's just more refined. I mean, it's more refined in terms of uh, and more specific. So less trained clinicians can respond to it more easily. Yeah. I am aware that we've almost run out of time. We've basically run out of time. I don't want to keep you longer. There is a final question about rigidity. Uh, would you be able to very quickly answer that? Is that okay? What would you advise on programs which aim to work on rigidity where learners withdraw ascent a lot? Ah, okay. Yeah, I think I get get flexible. <laughs> Like this is, I, I think there's a gift in behavior analysts by nature or controlling. It is who we are. I will never meet anyone who is in this field who isn't controlling by nature because that is why we are here. So I feel like part of our work personally and professionally is showing up as flexibly as possible. So I almost am like, I would encourage the practitioner to work on rigidity. Um, and and be more flexible and open to like what the learner has for today. Um, and I think this, yeah, sort of leans back to that everyone gets to have a bad day. Everyone gets to like want to be a little extra controlling of their environment too. Well, I think there's ways you can, I'm, I promise I'll keep it the short, <laughs> but I think there's also ways you can go about building that flexibility that still honor client um, needs and assent. So you could have the client list out, you know, here's do an analysis, find out the things that they want to be in control of, let them be in control of them, let them dictate them and change them. And then say, hey, today, I, let's be flexible about one thing. Which of these things do you care about the least that you're willing to be flexible? Or are you not? And so building it in by having them actually run that process of choosing what things they're willing to not be impassioned about for the day, or maybe there's nothing. Um, because, you know, I think we want to be flexible. We need to be flexible. There's times where we may not be able to be flexible to all the learners needs. And I hate when people say like a, but like, but I have to do this. Um, I have to, you know, strap my child in the car seat or I have to take them for a walk or do whatever. We don't have to do those things. Like we're clinicians. We come there for a two hour session where we can let our clients be in control of that. But building in that flexibility and letting them take the lead with how they build it, I think is the key there. And you can do that whether you, you're extremely vocal or you're not, like do it with picture symbols. You choose where you sit and have a picture of a person sitting. 
You choose if it's a, you know, what program we're doing. You choose where I sit, you choose all these things, and then they can choose the pictures they want to be flexible with. Thank you for that. OK, the last keyword is flexible. The last keyword is flexible. Please email me the three keywords with your full name as you want it on the certificate and your BCBA certification number. We're going to upload the recording to our YouTube channel soon. We've got about uh, a month to issue the CUs, so don't worry if you don't hear back straight from me. I will receive your email. I always receive them and I always get them done before the next Journal Club. Cassie, Kristen, thank you so, so, so much. This has been a beautiful talk, so useful. I know that people, uh, I can see that people enjoyed it from all the questions and all the uh, engagement, and we hope we're going to have you again in the future to talk more about this area because this is really, really crucial. Thanks again. Yeah, thank you. Bye.